Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the topology optimization webinar. Uh, my name is Jun Wu. I'm speaking from Delft. Uh, for those of you who might be joining this event for the first time, uh, topology optimization webinar was initiated last year as a substitute to physical conferences, which are either postponed or canceled. Um, this event is also organized, uh, endorsed by the International Society for Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization, which we are very grateful. Uh, it is organized every month. Uh, today is the ninth session. It's dedicated to data-driven approaches. It is organized by Professor Wei Chen from Northwestern University, together with Professor Xian Li Zhang from University of Illinois. Thank you very much, uh, Xian Li, and uh, Wei, the floor is yours. Uh, you are on mute. Yes, thank you very much, and Jing and Niles, um, for your dedicated service um, for providing this opportunity for us to exchange technical ideas. So um, it's my pleasure, together with uh, Dr. Sherry Zhang, to organize this session on data-driven approach in topology optimization. And I'm Wei Chen from Northwestern University. So uh, before we started the technical part, I'd like to make uh, two very quick announcements on behalf of the ESMO Society. Uh, the first one is about this new ESMO award that's named after Professor Haftika. Um, it's the Young Investigator Award, really recognizing Haftika's passion for mentoring young researchers. And the deadline is approaching. So um, it's actually the end of this, uh, this week. So the details are provided at the ESMO website. Um, so encourage people, especially young research to think about uh, uh, to be nominated for this award. The next announcement is about the World Congress uh, in Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization. So this is the biannual conference that our society has. Um, despite the fact that it's unlikely the, um, the international travel ban will be lifted this summer, uh, the conference organizers, led by Professor Kurt Maut, uh, they are really committed to making this virtual ex uh, conference a memorable experience for all the participants all over the world. Uh, so it's easy to attend. The paper is not required, and uh, this, the registration fee and cost will be much lower than the regular conference. So I encourage everyone of you here uh, to submit one or uh, more. Ask your students, colleagues to submit just abstract and the deadline is February. I think it's the mid of February. So next I'm going to start today's uh, session. So this is a session center on data driven approach in op uh, topology optimization. Uh, so simply speaking, this is a, 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 a group of methods that are using um, data driven or data science approach like machine learning AI technique try to go beyond the topology optimization, the conventional ones are gradient based. So here people are using either purely data driven or combination of data uh, machine learning together with topology optimization algorithms for solving um, a very difficult topology optimization problems. So the growing interest of, in this area is really evident in the increasing amount of publication in the SMO. Um, there's another interesting uh, phenomenon we see is that we see that as the data science method become more accessible, you know, made by the computer science folks, we find that um, the use of this uh, data driven topology optimization has gone beyond the conventional topology optimization research community. Uh, so the method has been employed by the researchers in other domains like physical science for solving their respective problems. So today here we actually have um, a combination of speakers, we invited speakers from both the TO research community, as well as those work in the physical science community to share their discoveries of using data-driven methods for topology optimization. We ask each speaker to address, in addition to talking about their research, try to answer two questions. The first one is really to tell us about what they think are the future opportunities of this topic area. Another one is to really try to share their view of what kind of problem will benefit the most from the data-driven methods compared to the conventional topology optimization approach. So with that, I'm going to ask Sherry to introduce the five invited papers 
and what we see as a recent trend of using this method. Sherry, please. Thanks, Wei. So as Wei mentioned, uh, the data-driven approaches has been a growing trend in the, uh, many areas, including topology optimization. In this webinar, we gather papers, uh, mainly from two types of machine learning models, the predictive models and the generative models. Uh, for the predictive models uh, are mainly used as some surrogate models to approximate some certain input-output relationships. And uh, examples can include the deep feed forward neural network and the convolutional neural network. So they are preferred in different scenarios uh, according to the different type of input. Uh, the second type is the generative models, uh, which can generate new samples based on the existing data. Uh, some examples include the variational autoencoder, as well as the generative adversal network, again. Um, and in this webinar, these models are going to be used in several different ways uh, in topology optimization, as you will see. And uh, uh, in, we have uh, grouped these uh, five talks into three different uh, categories. The first category um, use it is the forward machine learning in topology optimization. Um, basically, the machine learning is used to establish uh, surrogate models for various purposes. Uh, for the first one, uh, for example, the data-driven approach is used to replace the classical constituted relation of elasticity and to predict the material behavior using the discrete material data set. Uh, in the second work, um, the deep neural network is trained to directly map the design variables to sensitivities in order to accelerate the large-scale top-up problems. And in the second category that we have is to use the generative methods uh, for the inverse topology optimization to design metamaterials. The first work uh, uses the deep generative models uh, with the semi supervised learning strategy to design photonic metamaterials. The second work here uses a reinforced Monte Carlo method with the CNN as surrogate model to design the mechanical metamaterials to, uh, with target operations. And uh, the third category here is to use the data set and uh, machine learning uh, in the area of uh, multi-scale topology optimization. So uh, the representative work here uh, uses a large metamaterial database to simultaneously train a variational autoencoder as well as a regressor for the design of uh, microstructures, uh, graded family as well as multi-scale and aperiodic uh, material systems. So with that, um, like to uh, show you the schedule today. And before we introduce the first speaker, I will, uh, we would like to remind you that for the audience, if you have some questions, please feel free to type the, your questions and with the speaker name that you wanted to ask questions for. Um, and then we will um, either read your question on your behalf or you have the option of uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. All right. So let me, uh, without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker. So Ying, you can go ahead and. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ying Zhou, who is a former PhD student of uh, Professor Wei Hong Zhang, working now at Queensland University of Technology in Australia. Um, this work is a collaboration between Professor Wei Hong Zhang's group, who is here as well, um, and uh, at uh, Northwestern uh, Polytechnical University in China, and uh, Professor uh, Yuan Tong Gu's group at Queensland University of Technology in uh, Australia. Her talk is uh, a new data-driven topology optimization framework for structural optimization. And this work is published in Computers and Structures in 2020. Ying, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the invitation of Professor Chen, and thank you for the introduction of Shelley. Uh, and this is really a great honor for me 
to present our recent work on uh, the data-driven approach in topology optimization. Uh, so I will present the following four parts. Uh, so topology optimization has been uh, successfully applied in many fields to design lightweight high performance structures. In different applications, various models and uh, materials are used. The mechanical behavior description of materials remains a long-term open question due to their intrinsic complexities in the microstructures and the multi-physics effects. So many engineering structures are beyond the, the scope of linear elasticity and the material nonlinearity is a main concern. Different structures can be obtained if material nonlinearity is considered. So in the existing works, material nonlinearity is described with the phenomenological or physical-based constituting models. Uh, the traditional way is to calibrate the empirical constitutive models from the limited data. But things have changed now. The high throughput experiments, computations, and the open material dat database are leading us to a material uh, big data error. So this naturally raises a question about how to exploit the material big data in structural optimization. So with this idea in mind, we propose a data-driven topology optimization framework. Instead of using the empirical constitutive models, the material data set are directly used to describe the nonlinear constitutive model uh, uh, relationship. In this work, we uh, mainly focus on the trust optimization because of its simple strain stress relationship. So traditionally, the structural analysis for nonlinear problem is solved with the newton raphson solver. The displacement field is calculated globally, and the strain stress state are calculated locally. This iterative process is carried out, provided the constitutive model is uh, given in closed form. So this iterative process stops when the residue uh, of the displacement increment is smaller than a given threshold. However, the, pro uh, the process is not uh, effective when the discrete material data set is used. Here we use a data-driven solver. The condition is that the strain stress should satisfy both the conservation loss of equilibrium and the compatibility as well as the material data set. The basic idea of the data-driven solver is to minimize uh, the distance between the conservation loss and uh, the uh, material data set. The distance is defined with the strain energy and the complementary energy densities. The data-driven solver is composed into uh, inner and outer subproblems and solved iteratively. The inner subproblem is to find the strain and the stress satisfying the conservation loss, which is closest to the data in the material data set. The uh, the outer subproblem is to find the uh, to find the uh, strain and the stress uh, to find the data in material data set which is closest to the strain and the stress satisfying the conservation loss. So the inner subproblem is based on a guest point in the material data set. Uh, two nonlinear equations are solved globally to get two variables, u and lambda, where lambda measures the residue between the external force and the guest internal force. And uh, this equation corresponds to the uh, kinematic compatibility. And uh, the strain stress calculated here satisfies the conservation loss. The outer step problem is to find the data in the material data set which is nearest to the conservation loss. 
However, the nearest data might be the noises or outliers. To avoid this, a data cluster is considered instead of the individual nearest data. Each data in the cluster is assigned a probability. The closer the distance is, the larger the probability is. Then the expectation of the data cluster is the expected local strain and stress. And the data cluster in each iteration is determined with a simulate annealing scheme. Initially, a large data cluster is considered and then gradually reduced. When the solver approaches the solution, only a small data cluster is considered because the outliers far from the cluster does not affect the solution. Uh, another question is when to stop the iterative solver. Unlike the newton raphson solver, we use another criterion to stop the iter iterative solver when the strain and the stress no longer change. When the final strain and the stress satisfying the conservation loss is obtained, the structure is at equilibrium. Here, the structure and the compliance correspond to the work done by the external force. And the structural optimization problem is to minimize the structural end compliance. Uh, since the structure is at equilibrium, the adjo a joint method can be used for sensitivity analysis to calculate the uh, adjoint vectors, vector, uh, the derivative of stress with respect to the strain are firstly calculated. To this end, we represent the stress with a data cluster around it. Similarly, each point in the cluster is assigned a probability function. So the derivative calculation is transformed into calculating the derivative of the probability function. In this work, we choose the moving least square function as the probability. And the derivative calculation is validated with a noisy data set. For simplicity, the data set is generated based on an empirical model with random noises. This figure indicates that the derivative calculated with the discrete data set agree well with the analytic result. And the computing error decreases when the data size the data site size increase. To validate the data-driven topology optimization, we consider a benchmark 10 bar trust structure for different uh, data site size. The optimized bar areas agree well with the traditional one. The relative discrepancy of the optimized results decrease along with the increase of the data size, but the computational cost increases. Uh, besides, uh, we consider a three-dimensional three optimization with two different material data sites. For both data sites, the optimized results and bar areas agree well with the traditional results. And this example further highlights the importance of high accurate, uh, uh, high accurate description of material behavior. Uh, so to conclude, uh, to our uh, knowledge, this is a first study of using uh, data sites for the description of material behavior in trust optimization. Uh, we use the data-driven structure analysis method and developed the sensitivity analysis with discrete material data site. And the proposed method might be appealing in engineering applications with emerging new materials. And we have to see that this work is a, a very preliminary study and further studies can be made in the aspect of uh, data-driven 
uh, topology optimization of continuum uh, continuum structures of two dimensional and three dimensional, uh, and considering different types of material data sites such as the his history dependent material, and uh, also uh, the high efficiency computing with the discrete data site. So uh, that is all uh, for me today, and uh, thank you for your lis listening. Thank you, Yi, um, for a very, very nice, uh, very nice presentation. Um, thank you. And uh, okay, so any questions from the audience? I think the first one that I saw is uh, uh, Glaucio. Would you like to ask your questions? Yes. Uh... I was uh, very happy to see that uh, you are uh, considering nonlinear problems. Uh, this is very nice. The question that I have is, uh, how do you treat in your ground structure, how do you treat uh, the small areas, uh, the low density elements, uh, the elements that will disappear, that uh, the area vanishes? Uh, how do you do that? Do you have a filter? How, how do you treat the low areas? Uh, uh yes so for the um, for the uh, design variables is the uh, cross sectional areas of the band members and uh, uh, we set a very low uh, uh, a very low bound of the uh, design variables and we think if the if the area is reduced to the lower bound that we set then the the, the uh, the bar is eliminated from this structure. Um, we just use this uh, very simple and intuitive uh, criteria to uh, filter the weak, uh, weak bars. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The second question is, uh, is uh, did you compare other metrics such as computational time or standard top-up and your data-driven work? Uh, computation time. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so for now, the computational time is uh, a bit uh, slower than the traditional work because we have to deal with uh, a large data, a large data set, and uh, we uh, compile. We, we 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 pointed out that the um, computational cost will increase along with the. Uh, number of the data si data points in the data site, um, and uh, so we think uh, this is a very interesting uh, question and uh, uh, a very uh, good work to do in the future. That we need to use some like um, data mining and the data uh, organization technique to improve the computational. Uh, cost of our current framework. Thank you, Ying. I think we have uh, uh, more questions later, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end of the uh, session. Um, let's okay, thank, thank Ying you. and also Professor Wei Hong Zhang for their, uh, for their thank you. Yes. All right. So let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Yongming Liu. Um, professor Liu is currently an associate professor at Northeastern University in US. Uh, his research interests include nanooptics, metamaterials, and very recently deep learning assisted photonic design. So his talk is on probabilistic representation and inverse design of metamaterials based on deep generative model with semi supervised learning strategy. And this work was published in um, Advanced Materials. Professor Liu, please. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Chen and Shirley and other organizers for giving me this opportunity to present on this uh, exciting platform and exchange ideas with all of you. So I'd like to start with the introduction to metamaterials, in case some of you are not so familiar with this exciting topic. So metamaterials have enabled a lot of uh, exciting of uh, these uh, properties and the function based on the structure uh, design uh, strategy. 
So by using different uh, building blocks for the so-called matter atoms with the distinct geometries, people have created many exotic properties such as uh, uh, negative refract index and also some invisibility cloak. So uh, as you can see, the structure design really play a very important role. However, as you can imagine, the relationship between the structure and the property sometimes is highly complicated and uh, nonlinear and uh, non-intuitive. And uh, this is a particular tool when we want to design multifunctional, multidimensional, and even reconfigurable metamaterials working at the different uh, uh, conditions. So starting from about uh, three years ago, there has been strong interest to explore artificial intelligence, such as deep learning, to accelerate the photonic design, including metamaterials, photonic crystals, silicon, integrated silicon photonic devices, and also nanoplasmonic structures. So by using this uh, data-driven approach, we can unlock this highly complicated structure and the property relationship for optics. So we are working on this uh, polarization phase wavelengths and so on. So compared with a traditional uh, physics guided or rule-based rule -based numerical simulation or optimization, uh, deep learning model after training allow us to simultaneously carry out the forward prediction and the inverse design task with a speed much orders of magnitude faster than the conventional uh, approach. So there has been a lot of uh, exciting uh, research ongoing and uh, at least uh, some groups who are actively working on this area. And recently we published uh, one review article on this topic in Nature Photonics. So if you have interest, uh, you are very welcome to check this uh, paper. So this slide shows you the first attempt in my group trying to use a deep learning to design chiral metamaterials. So initially we consider a bilayer structure. The shape is a fixed. We have a U-shape splitting, splittering resonators. We control the dimension, the twisting angle, and also the separation between the two uh, splittering resonators. Overall, we have uh, five geometrical parameters. And in the, uh, uh, this uh, deep learning training process, we have uh, 25,000 data. So it sounds a very large number of uh, data, but if you consider five to the power of uh, 7.6, uh, on average, we only sparsely sample around 7.6 points for this, uh, each individual five continuous uh, these, uh, design parameters. But very surprisingly, we find out actually this uh, forward prediction and inverse design can work all, uh, very well. However, as you can see, there's a constraint in terms of the geometry. In order to harvest, in order to harness this uh, large degree of freedom in the design space, we really want to have an uh, arbitrary shaped geometry. I think that's one of the motivation in this uh, advanced material paper. So to realize the design for arbitrary shaped uh, geometry, we use this uh, pixelized image with a, a 64 by 64 pixelized image to represent the metamaterials design. And then we use the so-called uh, encoder decoder configuration to uh, embed the geometry together with the optical response into the so-called latent space. So you will see the latent space, latent space allow us to get some useful information in the design uh, process. And uh, very importantly, we can solve the so-called one-to-many mapping issue in the inverse design. One given function or response, we could have uh, more than one geometry to satisfy this uh, requirement. Typically, this will cause some convergence issue in the design process. But uh, now by using this method, we can overcome this uh, issue. So on this slide, I just want to show you the architecture of the generating model. In total, we have uh, three 
fully connected neural networks. They do different tasks. I'm not going to discuss a detail, but uh, you can see we generally have this uh, recognition model, prediction model, and the generation model to complete the design task. In the following, I will focus on the performance of the model. So here uh, you can see we have a three basic structure, cross uh, structure, the U-shape resonator and h shaped structure. Very importantly, you can see in the latent space, it's a two dimensional latent space, the different uh, category, uh, the different structure actually tends to cluster in a certain region of the latent space. This is a very useful because typically we consider deep learning model is a black box. We don't know what's going on here. However, it turns out different structures have a certain correlation among themselves and they uh, disperse in a certain region of the latent space. This allow us to get this uh, latent variable to select the geometry you want to design. And uh, here I will show you the on-demand uh, on design of the anisotropic photonic metamaterials. So here our structure is uh, anisotropic. So we look at the reflectance spectrum for X and Y polarization instance, we could have the cross polarized light. So in the first figure, we just uh, actually assign very uh, this uh, rough requirement on the, ref uh, on the reflectance spectrum. But using our structure, uh, this uh, deep learning model, we can easily find out a uh, number of uh, uh, structures satisfying the required, re uh, required reflectance spectrum. So here I just uh, give you uh, these two examples for this particular spectrum. And here is another example so you can clearly see the geometry is uh, very different, but uh, both of them can satisfy the initially defined optical spectrum. So this is a one uh, layer structure. And we also demonstrate the design of a bilayer, or we can consider three dimensional metamaterials. In this case, we are looking at this uh, uh, chiral structures for the optical response. So finally, of course, the uh, request of the organizer, I just want to share a few words about uh, how we can leverage deep learning together with the optimization. I myself is not an expert on the topology optimization, but I think uh, there are certainly a lot of opportunities to leverage both of them. First of all, topology optimization can generate high quality training data because for deep learning model, not only the data size, but also the quality is important. Secondly, we can use a topology optimization to further refine the structure, which are in worse design by the deep learning models. And uh, finally, potentially we can integrate deep learning and the topology optimization together for the so-called uh, global optimization. Because for metamaterials, at least, we have uh, a lot of uh, unit cell. We need to uh, globally optimize the individual structures together to find out the optimal structure in the end. So with that, I conclude my talk. I just want to appreciate the, uh, the effort and the work from my group members, collaborators, and the funding support. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Liu. Um, we can start with some questions. I haven't seen any questions in the chat box. Um, Sherry, did you receive any questions? Yes, there's one that uh, just came up from Mohammed. Okay, so um, the question is uh, from Mohammed is, how can you ensure that the structure generated by the decoder is feasible with no discontinuities? This is a good question. I'm not so sure what do you mean by the discontinuity? Um, so, for example, structure may not be okay. that can be fabric cannot be fabricated, say, by editing. Okay, 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 okay. So this is a very good point. And uh, here uh, we have uh, uh, several ways to overcome this uh, limitation in order to physically fabricate the structure. So we can use some technique to filter out those uh, very tiny structures. 
And here, at least uh, in this uh, work, we, every, every structure, they are continuous. And if we want to do some uh, random structure design, uh, uh, of course, that's, uh, we can use uh, Fourier transform to fill out some, you know, this uh, high order fine features of the structures. Yeah, this is a very good uh, question. Um, I'd like to ask the question that, um, you know, for this, the kind of problem you're interested in, sometimes it's very difficult to find the solution. You know, it's yes. not obvious, right? Yes. So how do you, uh, what kind of method do you use to make the kind of lead a solution to the space you want? Because the initial starting data set is also very important in this yes. case. Yes, uh, absolutely true. So here, I think uh, the data-driven approach really allow us to discover some relationship. Uh, very interestingly, although this, the, the relationship is highly nonlinear, but uh, based on a huge amount of data, we can interpolate the relationship to some extent, okay? And here, I think the so-called latent space just allow us to find out some more subtle details in this uh, relationship. I think that's uh, one uh, very exciting uh, aspect by using this model. Yeah, we have a few more questions coming in. If you want, you know, allow me to add a few more questions here from sure. one is from Aragon about your neural network model is a stochastic gradient descent, so it's gradient based. So, mm -hmm. uh, is any issue that your um, your work will also lead to just a, a local optimal solution? Because there's no guarantee that your network parameter will lead to global optimal. Yes, that's true. So uh, we still occasionally occasionally uh, have some issue, but overall, compared with a uh, conventional this optimiz optimization method, I think we can uh, overcome the problem at large, yeah. Next question from Lian Men is, uh, how do you, can you quickly briefly explain that the one-to-many mapping issues inverse design and how did you deal with that? Okay, so here is the, uh, I think uh, for the given, uh, given function you want to have, right? We could physically, we could have a more than one structure to satisfy the requirement, although not perfectly, but to a large extent, you can satisfy the requirement. This is so-called a one-to-many uh, issue. And uh, this one will cause a convergence uh, problem in the deep learning uh, networks because the deep learning networks don't know, the model don't know where to go, where to converge. So that's the issue. So to overcome this issue, the latent space can help a lot because now you know roughly, right, for the structure uh, in the corresponding variable, uh, this uh, latent variable is uh, in which regions you can purposely sample in the latent space within uh, certain areas to a large uh, probability to find these uh, suitable structures. So that's the idea to overcome this issue. Yeah, so uh, I, we have received this many other interesting questions, um, but I'm afraid we have to hold this question to the end after we finish the five talks. So let's move forward for the okay. next speaker. Uh, but Professor Liu, if you can just take a look at some of the other questions in the chat sure, box. I can we'll do come that. Back yeah. later on. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can send your response to them directly. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Liu and uh, Chen. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Glaucio Polino. Um, he's a Raymond Allen Jones Chair at the Georgia Institution of Technology. And uh, his talk is Universal Machine Learning for Topology Optimization. And this work is published in uh, Computer Methods in Applied Mechanics and Engineering, CMME, in 2021. And, uh, Also, is there? Just a second. Sorry. Oops. Is it okay now? Yes. Uh, th thank you. 
I am uh, going to talk about uh, machine learning for topology uh, optimization using a universal approach. And uh, if you are a newcomer to the field, uh, I would say that uh, this is an approach that uh, you may consider. Here, we only solved one problem, but uh, we think the approach can be extendable uh, to other problems. My collaborators are uh, Dr. Uh, Heng Shi. Initially, he was at Georgia Tech, and then uh, now he is at Siemens. And um, uh, Dr. Elaine Tang uh, for, uh, from Siemens, uh, Dr. Lucia Mirabella, Dr. Livio Daloro, both from Siemens, and uh, Professor Le Song and uh, Yu Yu Zhang uh, from Georgia Tech. So, uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, they have been pervasive in our lives. Uh, we see examples each and every day. For example, here on uh, the on the left, uh, we can see the 18 time champion uh, Lee Sedol playing with the AlphaGo computer program. And uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 hello? Uh, so, can you mute yourself? <laughs> so, yeah, can Jin mute the uh, anyone who is unmuted? Yeah, thank Go you. Ahead, Russia, yeah. Th thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lee said all lost. Uh, they played uh, five games, but uh, something amazing. Uh, he lost four games, but he won one game. Uh, and this is quite amazing. And then uh, we have seen examples of uh, AI and uh, ML in uh, instant translation. For example, image segmentation, self driving cars. We have seen. Uh, Amazon, Tesla, Google, and also in artistic style transfer, as we can see here on the bottom right. So the key, key question that we have is, can we use deep learning to accelerate topology optimization without losing accuracy? Because the accuracy is very important. Before uh, I answer that, uh, I just want to give a brief overview in the literature a lot of, and this is a representative paper, a lot of the literature, they do um, a lot of uh, offline training, and then uh, they train the machine learning, and then uh, later they try to get the solution of uh, the problem for a certain uh, boundary conditions in one shot, either a low resolution one or a high resolution, as you can see here on uh, this slide. And uh, this approach has had uh, a lot of success. However, there are some uh, limitations, for example, you can get uh, designs with uh, structural defects, uh, as you can see here, maybe unable to perform large scale designs, uh, the scaling might be a problem. Collecting uh, the training data can be quite expensive and uh, there is a question if it can be generalized uh, to any domain. In other words, uh, could uh, the machine learning solve a problem that it has never seen? So here is uh, our approach. Uh, is to use uh, an uh, online uh, training approach is to train a deep learning model based on the history data to learn the mapping between a given design and uh, its sensitivity. A straightforward approach may not work because uh, if you see here, we have a problem from uh, 80,000 design variables, for example, to 1.5 million. And uh, you can see that the number of parameters in the deep learning model can uh, increase, can blow up very fast, can go up to 3 billion or so. And uh, this will exhaust uh, our capabilities in terms of algorithms, in terms of software, and uh, also in terms of hardware, uh, the GPU memory that uh, is used uh, to solve the problem. So uh, what is the idea then? Uh, we propose a multi-scale topology optimization approach. This uh, multi-scale approach is based on uh, the multi-resolution approach that we proposed a few years back. Uh, the reference is at the bottom of the slide. And then uh, we have a coarse scale mesh and a fine scale mesh. And then uh, we have a mapping between the two. In the coarse scale mesh, uh, that's where uh, we solve for the coarse grain information, displacements and the strains, uh, the state equations and the no optimization. Uh, for the fine scale mesh is where we have the optimization, the design variables and the, the sensitivities. So how does this work? Uh, essentially here at the bottom left, then uh, you can see the fine scale elements and uh, the coarse scale one. And uh, the block size uh, we introduce here is essentially associated uh, to the number of divisions in the fine scale element. Uh, for example, an edge in the fine scale here, the block size is five. 
that's what corresponds the, the edge in the coarse scale. So here is our tailored uh, two-scale topology optimization. And essentially, this allows us to decompose the global design into local instances that are based on the coarse scale mesh. And we can see here an illustration of the instances. And now we get something very nice with the multi-scale approach, because here with the yellow shading is the previous approach that didn't work. But now, for example, using a block size of five, we can see that the number of deep learning parameters is more or less constant. And also the GPU memory is more or less constant. And uh, this makes the problem treatable. So here is the architecture of our deep learning. Essentially, in our input layer, in the fine scale elements, we have the design variables. And uh, for our uh, state variables, then in the coarse scale, the coarse grain information, we have the strains over there and the displacements. We have some hidden layers, and the output is the sensitivity that uh, can be obtained then without solving the uh, state equations directly. So here is the overall flow chart. Uh, you can see here that this loop on uh, the left is the standard loop in uh, topology optimization. But then uh, when we want to apply the deep learning, at the first we started in the usual way, but uh, since this is an online approach, then uh, at some point we are going to apply the deep learning model, but then uh, solve the problem in uh, the course scale, apply the deep learning model, and then uh, do our design update. The main features is that uh, there is no separate training step. This is an online approach to update, to constantly provide new supervision. As I am going to explain in the examples, provide a controllable GPU memory and uh, is highly scalable. Here, uh, the first example, uh, here are the design parameters that we use. Here I am using a block five of, uh, block size of five. And uh, this is the same example as be before from uh, 80,000 design variables to 1.5 million. And then we can see here in the fine scale, uh, the stiffness matrix size is pretty big, but in the coarse scale is significantly smaller. Here the state equations are solved uh, using the PCG with a Jacobi preconditioner on a single GPU. Here are uh, the training parameters that uh, you can see on the top on uh, this uh, blue uh, shading here that gives an idea how the online updating uh, is done. And uh, in green for the three different meshes, then uh, we have the standard solution of topology optimization. And uh, in blue, you have uh, our solution using the machine learning and you can see that the results are uh, pretty good, are uh, almost uh, identical, and the number of solves are uh, substantially reduced, about 10 times or so. And uh, one aspect that uh, I would like to call your attention is that uh, it seems that uh, with our approach, the larger the problem, the more speed up we can get from the method. And uh, for example, here for our mesh three is the highest speed up is around four or so for this problem. That is still relatively small. The second example then is uh, this one. And uh, here what we did is uh, to keep the number of design variables fixed. And uh, then uh, we changed just the block size from two to four to eight. And then uh, here we can see the fine scale size of the, our stiffness matrices and uh, the coarse scale. And then uh, you can see here the standard solution and uh, the different block sizes. And uh, one aspect that we see is that the solutions for all of them are pretty good. And the smaller block size allow us to provide less supervision that refers to the number of exact solves to the deep learning model in our proposed framework. For example, smaller block size, then we have less solves, less supervision, and the bigger block size, more solves, more supervision in the deep learning approach. And uh, one aspect that we see here is that uh, the, if we choose a proper block size, then uh, the speed up can be quite good. For example, with a block size here, about four, the speed up can be up to eight times, more or less. And uh, in summary, then uh, we have seen this uh, universal machine learning approach with no pre-collected uh, training data that is needed in the process. It can be readily applied to any design problems and can be potentially combined with any other regression machine learning models, such as the ones that Shelley showed uh, in the beginning of uh, the webinar. And uh, as I said, I hope that uh, you can consider this uh, if you are uh, using machine learning in topology optimization and solve and use this approach to problems that we didn't. 
And uh, now, uh, Shelly and uh, Wei, they ask us to address the challenges uh, and opportunities in uh, data-driven uh, topology optimization. How much time I have? Uh, you have your overtime. Overtime, all right. <laughs> so then uh, this is uh, an ongoing work. And uh, what uh, I would like to say is that we need uh, to develop approaches that uh, can allow us to uh, engineer the things that we design. A lot of the papers in the literature, they don't deliver the engineering. We need to deliver the engineering, as you can see here, in terms of the global scale and the local scale. This is a work in collaboration with Emily Sanders and Anderson Pereira on an optimal and continuous multi lattice embedding. Uh, it's presently under review. And uh, here is the prototype that you can see where uh, the features here are a micro in scale size, as you can see. And finally, one remark is that we have a guaranteed connectivity with a functionally graded material transition. And in this length scale of the functional gradation, we can provide, we can have an infinite number of uh, microstructures, infinite, that uh, we can feed into uh, a machine learning model that can handle this massive data set to create, for example, new structures and materials with unprecedented properties. And finally, uh, other areas that I think we need to look at uh, is uh, physically based approaches. We should not use the machine learning as a black box. Sometimes we need to connect it with the mechanics. Nonlinearities, like in the first talk is great. And uh, the work that uh, Way is doing, we are exploring it in our group on the multi-class microstructures using uh, latent variables. And this may be part of the last talk. Thank you very much. Sorry about the time. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, okay, we may have time for one or two questions. Uh, the first question uh, we have here is uh, from Hammond. Uh, how accurate are the sensitivity estimates and do the approximate sensitivities cause optimization convergence issue? Uh, also, is the training time included in the total time measured? Yes, well, th there are several questions there, right? Uh, yeah. Again, uh, the sensitivity will be uh, as good as uh, our uh, parameters in the system, but in general, the sensitivity, I would say, is very, very good, uh, especially for this type of problem that uh, essentially this was just a, a compliance-based uh, pro problem. And uh, as you can see here, for, for example, for this problem, oops, sorry. For this problem, I have the parameters here, right? Uh, for example, for the initial, we had uh, 10 steps for the initial tra training step and uh, 10 for the initial training window size. And then uh, for example, here we did the online update frequency every uh, 25 steps, okay? Every 25, that's the way this was done. And here our update window size had the size of two. And for this, the uh, sensitivities were uh, quite accurate and uh, the, you can find uh, the results uh, in the paper. And uh, yes, uh, the training time has been included here in the time that I provided. You see, uh, there is nothing done separate. This is online training. This is online training. So the training time has been included in all the time I provided. And that's the reason that this can be applied to any problem. It's not like uh, the standard uh, machine learning approach where you do things separate and then, uh, you try to solve the, uh, the problem at hand, here uh, is all integrated in the online approach. Did I answer all the questions? I don't know. Uh, uh, another quick question from Ole is, uh, how does this compare to your earlier work uh, on the multi-resolution top-up in terms of efficiency and result quantity? Maybe very quick. Y yes, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it, it compares uh, very well because essentially, uh, our two-scale framework is the multi-resolution approach. It is the same. It's, it's the same idea. Uh, it's just that now uh, it's done in this uh, deep learning uh, framework. And uh, we believe that uh, this, uh, uh, this, diff this separation right, of the optimization from the state equation, I think this is the key. And uh, this can be explored uh, not just in this problem, but uh, also in other problems. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we have to move on for the next speaker and there's so many good questions were raised and if we have time at the end, we're going to revisit those questions. So I'd like to introduce 
uh, our next speaker with Professor Stefano Zapparia. He is a professor of theoretical physics of matter and the coordinator of the Center for Complexity and the Biosystems at the University of Milan. And his talk is on automatic design of mechanical metamaterial actuator. And the work is published on nature in the nature um, communications. Professor um, Zapari, please. We don't hear anything from you. You may need to unmute yourself. Sorry. I just lost uh, 20 seconds. Okay, <laughs> joking. So thank you very much for your introduction. And also thank you very much for the invitation. I'm one of the speakers who is outside of the field of uh, topological uh, uh, optimization. So it's very good to be in contact with this big community, which is a bit uh, different from mine. So I'm a physicist working in uh, statistical physics and material science. So uh, this work has been also supported by the European Research Council. And um, let me uh, tell you a bit what I uh, have in mind. So we are working here on mechanical actuators. Of course, there can be several types of actuators. Now we are talking about purely mechanical actuators. So just converting one motion into another motion and the simple example would be like a door lock where you push the door lock and and then uh, uh, something happens inside and you have and you have uh, you open or close the door and normally uh, this these machines are compute are, are constructed by different pieces so you just assemble a lot of pieces so there is a sort of sort of complexity involved so with all these uh, uh, gears that you have to put together so this is just a, an example of, of a deconstructed door lock and now uh, this is just a way to introduce you with metamaterials for those who who don't know so metamaterials uh, achieve movement and uh, uh, unusual behavior at least mechanical metamaterials just uh, in uh, a uh, single piece that can be uh, singly uh, 3D printed. And here is a very nice example of the door lock uh, made by a group in uh, Potsdam. And, and essentially they, they created a door lock uh, in a single piece, uh, 3D printed. And the way they did that is just by choosing carefully all the cells and put them in such a way so that they have the desired uh, movement. So it's just a manual design. And, and we wanted to address this problem with an automatic design method. So what we did is uh, imagine a system in which you have have some input and some output movement that you want to uh, obtain, and then you want to create the best structure. So of course, this is the typical example of uh, topology optimization in some sense. But uh, in, in our way, we want to do it in a simple way, we, in a lattice. So basically, we have just a simple lattice and, and then uh, try to um, find a, a way to compute uh, the, the best moment, the most efficient uh, input-output relation. And we do it uh, in a discrete way. Not We don't use uh, finite elements. We just use a discrete uh, element model, very discretized, in which we have just uh, uh, stretching and bending. We are also doing now 3D uh, applications, which we have also torsion. But it's a very simple model, so which can be solved very fast. And in the end, uh, you compute an efficiency, which is the input versus the output motion. So you can have different examples you can find in the paper. And what we do is we do uh, add and remove bonds, uh, uh, trying to minimize a cost function. And we do that uh, in a way that uh, uh, in a, that is uh, sort of Monte Carlo, but with some uh, uh, simulated annealing. So we, we go up and down in temperature so that we can explore the phase space. And this is typical from my field, which is disordered systems, statistical physics of disordered systems, where we have many minima, and we don't want to get stuck into a, a metastable minimum. So we want to find the global minimum. And this is an example of what will happen. So you just uh, probe and uh, compute the energy, uh, I mean, this cost function, and try to see whether what's the best way to go as left as possible with this machine. And, and in the end, uh, when you're happy about it, uh, you, can, you can find uh, the final uh, solution. And uh, uh, here is an example of the complexity of the problem. So you have a lot of efficiencies that you're probing. Uh, and maybe this green curve is the best one, so the highest efficiency. Uh, and others are also good, but maybe not as good as this one. And, and since the phase space is so complex, so you have different uh, histories that bring you to different places. So you, you have to, to work on that to, to, to choose the best. And, uh, and then at the end, when you are happy about your solution, what you can do is, is use a finite element code to, to be sure that what you have obtained is not a feature that is uh, uh, something that comes from the discrete element model. So it's, it is really true and, and you can now uh, test it in a more uh, rigorous way. 
And then, and then at the end of the day, you can also 3D print your structure. And this is an example of the same structure and check that it's really, uh, first of all, it's printable. So you can really uh, do it. These are simple structures. So in 2D, so it's easy, but in 3D, it's not so easy sometimes. And, and then uh, check also experimentally that the efficiency you got is really the real efficiency of the sample. Then we, we, were, we wanted to challenge also this uh, Potsdam paper. They had uh, pliers, for instance, and we wanted to do a machine design plier here. And uh, so because, of course, we can always do some uh, human design, but not be so smart. So we tried to, to, to check with somebody else's design. And in this case, we get uh, much better efficiency in general with our machine design and, uh, and also uh, independent of various parameters like the input force or the stiffness of the of the um, pliers. But then uh, now let's come to the real focus of this session is about uh, uh, how to improve the scaling with artificial intelligence. Here we study the algorithmic scaling. So it is uh, um, it, it becomes uh, slower, of course, when you have more and more elements, and but also the efficiency becomes larger. So there is a trade-off. You want to have better efficiency. Maybe you want to increase the elements, but on the other hand, you increase the time. So there is a problem with this. And so we were thinking about uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning. In this guy, case, we use a, a convolution a neural network. And uh, what we feed the convolution neural network, this, these uh, uh, neural networks are well trained uh, and well uh, uh, let's say, uh, fine-tuned for images. So we feed an image to the, to the neural networks together with the efficiency, just a, a pixelized image of our structure. And we train these neural networks with the histories that I just showed you. So we train many things. We give the efficiency and the image. And at the end, when the uh, neural network is trained, we try to we give them uh, a new uh, structure that they hasn't seen. And we try to predict the images, uh, the efficiency from the images. And uh, this works pretty well, and uh, both on the uh, on the validation set, so we have very good accuracy. So once the, the machine is trained, it can predict uh, the efficiency. So you can even do a simulation in which you just uh, uh, find give new, start from a structure and let the machine decide what to do. So just with artificial uh, with artificial neural networks, which one to remove. And uh, uh, and so this is uh, fine, but of course uh, uh, we have a problem because we have we had first uh, to train the machine in order to be so efficient. So we had to solve the mechanical problem at some point. So, but then we were thinking about what kind of information we can get out of this. And one thing that these neural networks will uh, allow you to do is to uh, look at the uh, move and, and see, look at an image and tell, and tell you which bonds are more important to uh, change the efficiency, either positively or negatively. And, uh, and then we compared uh, what we got from uh, uh, the neural networks to the discrete element calculation. And it's, of course, a very good uh, comparison. What is less uh, trivial is the fact that we can also now train the neural network on a small system, which is easier to solve, and then feed it uh, with a, a larger system, with uh, more bonds. And so, the, of course, it hasn't seen this, this system is a different system size, but still it can give you a reasonable, uh, a reasonable, um, uh, let's say, um, idea of which bonds are important and which one are, are not so important for, uh, for the efficiency. So which bonds are, are crucial when you, when you want to uh, increase or decrease the uh, efficiency. Of course, the correlation coefficients between the, the real calculation discrete element model and the, the neural networks is, uh, of course, much worse in the case of uh, uh, a larger system, which, uh, which you, don't, you, you never have seen in the training set. But I think this, is, this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, transfer learning are uh, uh, potential for improvement, uh, this, for improving this kind of, uh, of systems. And so finally, just to say what I think is, uh, I, I think the, the way forward and the interesting challenging question is not only optimize geometry with these metamaterials, but also maybe uh, microstructure with the same technique and at the same time uh, also synthesis. So if we can put uh, these three things together, I think uh, we, can, uh, we can obtain very interesting uh, uh, 
uh, structures that can be useful and, and very optimized. And with this, uh, I would like also to thank my team uh, working with me at the University of Milan, Francesco von Kloss, uh, who's a mathematician, uh, Roberto Guerra, who's a researcher, a physicist, and Silvia is also a postdoc, a physicist, and a uh, master's student, uh, Lorenzo Beretta. And uh, with this, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Zapari, for a very interesting work. Um, I'd like to say that your work is somewhat different from the, some of the talks we have here but it represents a very interesting uh, category of design problem that's related to configuration and also has some dynamic uh, behavior associated with it. And it, you can view the design also as a network. Um, so one question I would have, you know, before we get the question from the audience, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is the strategy you use to move design from one to another? Is this more random generation, you know, the links, or do you have any strategy that you actually apply to it? So uh, we do a, um, a sort of Monte Carlo method. So we, we choose at random, but then uh, we accept move according to this cost function. And, and we do that, uh, sometimes we accept moves that are not uh, efficient. No, that's the idea, because we want to avoid to, to, it's very easy to fall into a metastable minimum. So a minimum that is maybe local, locally optimal. So any single bond movement will not decrease, uh, increase the efficiency, but uh, uh, it's not the global minimum. So, so to avoid this problem, we do this uh, uh, simulated meeting, which have cycles of temperature, and, and so sometimes we, we choose moves that are not very efficient. So it's a combination of randomness and, uh, and optimization. Yes, yeah. And the second question, I see there's a question coming from the audience here from Amin, uh, is that, um, do you finally remove those zero force elements from your obtained yeah. design? Yeah, sometimes we do, uh, in the example I showed, they were still there dangling and, uh, uh, but uh, yes, we do, of course. Yeah, yeah, we take care of that uh, in, in the most, uh, in, in some realization, of course. But of course, we, want, may, we may want to put them there, back. So uh, in the algorithm, it's not necessarily better to remove them because you remove them, then uh, it's harder to put them there, back when you want to reconnect them. So it's, uh, it's a trade-off. We tried both strategies. But of course, when you print it at the end, you would like to remove them because you don't need them. Yeah, so the next question from Casper is how, why would we choose this type of method over say trust structure gradient based algorithm? Because there seem to be very large number of system evaluation used in your, um, in your calculations. So trust uh, structure gradient based method is the method in structural optimization for uh, yes. trust type of structure. Well, I, I must admit, I didn't uh, uh, benchmark my algorithm with the trust uh, structure gradient uh, based method. I think if I understand uh, uh, that the, the algorithm works with uh, gradient, uh, uh, is a gradient based, then a gradient base will go to a local minimum. So uh, that would be my naive answer, but not an expert in the, in the field. So I might be wrong. So uh, if, if you go by the gradient, then you end up in, uh, in the minimum, the nearest minimum. Um, question from Gasho, uh, what about 3D? You show the 2D example. I only show 2D. So now we, we have done the algorithms also in 3D. It, you had to introduce also, introduce also torsion in the elements. We did that. And you can get also structures in, in 3D with the Monte Carlo algorithm. We still haven't solved the problem uh, with uh, the convolutional neural networks because these algorithms are really optimized for 2D. So that's something we, we are uh, working on. But for the part of discrete elements, of course, there's no, no conceptual difference problem to do it in, in 3D, you just have to add torsion. Thank you very much. And uh, we have to move on to the next paper now. Uh, we have one more question in the chat box. Maybe uh, uh, you can respond uh, separately. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, let me introduce the last speaker. Our last speaker is Li Wei Wang. He's a pre-doctoral visiting student from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, who is currently working with Professor Wei Chen at Northwestern University in the US. Uh, his talk is Deep Generative Modeling for Mechanistic Based Learning and Design of Metamaterial Systems. And this work has been published on CMAME in 2020. Liwei, you have the floor.
You're currently. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Zhang. And hello, everyone. Today, I would like to talk about our recent research on degenerative modeling for mechanistic based learning and design of metamaterial systems. Metamaterials are artificial materials that derive properties from the geometry of microstructures rather than constituent material. For example, these three samples have the same base material but different microstructures, so they will have very different stiffness. This concept stems from the study on optics and has quickly extended to other areas. By designing the microstructures, we could dissolve the boundary between material and structural design and unify them under the framework of multi-scale metamaterial system design, namely to design topology or property distribution at the macro scale level and try to achieve the optimized property distribution by assembling the microstructures. In this study, we develop uh, data-driven methods for both inverse microstructure design and its multi-scale system design, especially on the uh, periodic multi-scale system to achieve specially varying properties. Specifically, we come up with a data-driven framework that could facilitate and expedite different design stages by integrating a large metamaterial database, machine learning models, and design algorithms. Our proposed methods begin with uh, a data set uh, construction, where we construct a large data set with diverse shape and properties. Once we create a data set, we apply machine learning methods to extract mechanics knowledge to understand the geometry property relations. This knowledge is useful for inverse microstructure design, as well as providing some building blocks for the assembling a periodic multi-scale system. We could use it to do scalable design for structures with specially varying properties and well-connected unit cells. Our database construction method can be found in these two papers we published in SNO and JND. Again, the goal here is to construct a large database with diverse shape and properties which is beneficial for machine learning and multi-scale design. Specifically, we first uniformly sample the stiffness tensor as the design targets, and then use sync method to find corresponding micro uh, structures. They form the initial database. And then we select those micro structures with properties near the boundary or sparse area of the property space and perform stochastic shape perturbations on them. By doing this, we can obtain new microstructures with properties and geometries different from the original one. By doing this iteratively, we could systemically populate the database. Our paper in the Journal of Mechanical Design provides metrics and algorithms for achieving shape and property diversity. In this study, we only focus on isotropic structures, that is, the geometry and properties have isotropic symmetry. It only requires four independent entries to describe uh, the stiffness matrix. They span the property space of the database. With the proposed data-driven um, database generation method, we construct a database with nearly 250,000 microstructures covering a wide property space. This data set is available at our research website. Now we have the database, but those microstructures will be very diverse and complicated it is difficult to find the relation between shape and properties. Therefore, we need to organize them and find some underlying patterns to facilitate microstructures as well as its multi-scale system design. To achieve this, a variational autoencoder and a regressor for the property are simultaneously chained. The encoder will incompress the microstructures into a low dimensional latent space. The decoder tries to reconstruct from it while the regressor tries to predict the uh, properties. So the narrow bottleneck in the middle will force the model to learn the salient features for properties and shapes. In fact, we observe that the latent space has meaningful mathematical structures and rich physical information. Firstly, different vectorized direction in the latent space encodes different shape morphing patterns. Secondly, the distance in the shape space provides a measure for shape similarity. Similar shapes are close to each other. And finally, the latent space forms a conceptual map where different abstract concepts of microstructures, such as high stiffness and low stiffness, occupy different regions in the latent space. So in some way, this latent space has become a control panel for the metamaterial. 
With this control panel, we can achieve easy tuning of properties and geometries by simple vector arithmetic in the latent space. For example, um, for the first matrix in the stiffness matrix C11, we discover a corresponding arrow in the latent space. By moving at this direction, um, complex geometry manipulations can be easily achieved to increase the C11 value. Similar errors could be found for other properties such as the Poisson's ratio and other properties. Recognizing that inverse microstructure design is not unique, we also develop a clustering-based algorithm to select or generate diverse candidate for a given property by capitalizing the distant matrix and, performance, uh, and performing simple clustering in the latent space. Finally, by graph searching and interpolation in the latent space, metamatch families can be efficiently generated, rendering the target's gradation of the properties. Now let's go back to the original motivations of multi-scale design. Building on the large database and machine learning model, a two-stage framework is proposed here for multi-scale design. Here we show an example uh, of achieving the prescribed distortion of the full structure. We first optimize the property distribution and then assemble the full structure to ensure compatibility between neighboring urine cells. Specifically, in the first stage, the large database we constructed provides the constraint and guidance for optimization so that we can modify the TO algorithm to directly optimize the property distribution of micro uh, structure. These four pictures here show the concurrently optimized multidimensional property distribution, C11 to C33. After, uh, after that, we need to assemble the full structure. With our VAE model, a diverse set of candidates can be obtained for each target properties at different locations in the full structure. A nodal energy is defined for each candidate to measure how well it can achieve the target property. The smaller, the better. Although we have a candidate set, not all of them can be compatible with its neighboring unit cell. Therefore, an each energy is defined for each neighboring pair, considering both geometry and mechanics compatibility. Also, the smaller, the better. With this, we can consider each element as a node on the Markov random field so that the original assembling problems now becomes a classical graph minimization, a graph energy minimization problem. This can be solved efficiently by dual decomposition with the parallel computing. We apply the proposed framework to design a periodic structures with various target distortion behavior. For example, when you squeeze this little face, it will give you a smile. When you stretch this bean, it will show ozetic behavior. We try simple method but only obtain a structure with many gray or disconnected elements. To summarize, we propose an efficient construction method of a large database with diverse microstructure and properties. Since the geometries are complicated, we propose a deep generative model to compress all the microstructures into a low dimensional latent space with desirable mathematical structure and mechanistic information. This provides a control panel for the inverse design of metamaterial. You can control the properties and geometries by simple vector arithmetic. As we know, most existing mass scale design are limited to structures composed by periodic unit cells of several periodic subregions. In this study, we show how to use this data-driven method to facilitate a periodic mass scale design with heterogeneous properties and well-connected microstructures. As the last part of this talk, uh, we want to share our thoughts on the challenges of DATO. We feel that these four directions are promising. The first one is those designs with complicated underlying mechanism or material law. For example, the pattern switching design, photonic designs, and the consideration of manufacturing induced heterogeneity. Here, the simulation and sensitivity are expensive or even impossible to obtain. In this case, machine learning can be used for surrogate modeling, like, just like what other professors presented in their talks. The second one is the design with multiple scales or components, like what we show in this talk. For example, a data-driven approach may help to adjust the um, nonlinearity and um, caused by the microstructure and the complexity brought by the uh, periodicity and multiple components. Currently, most machine learning models only focus on geometries, but not ge geometry property relations. There are potentials for extending new models developed in the computer science community to TO design. 
by bringing more physics into the model, it can achieve better generalizability, less data requirement, and higher interpretability. Finally, we would like to call for the community to create and share standard data sets and benchmark problems to accelerate the development of this area. Thank you. Thank you, Li Wei. Uh, very impressive timing, 10 minutes exact. Thank you. And very comprehensive uh, and uh, impressive framework. So we Thank do you. have Thank some you. questions uh, from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Aragon. Um, is, uh, you, the question is, your entire framework hinges on the choice of the dimension of your latent space. How did you choose this? And how do you know whether your latent space is rich enough? Oh, yes. I, I think that's a very good question. Uh, we determine the dimension of the latent space by observing the trade-off between the dimensionality and the reconstruction uh, quality. This is because currently there's no standard way on the selection of dimensionality of the latent space because it depends on the amount, diversity, and resolution of the training data set. So uh, based on our empirical uh, study, a higher dimensionality uh, does not provide much improvement in the reconstruction loss in our case. That's why we choose uh, 16 uh, dimensional latent space. Yeah. Thank you, Liu. Uh, the second question is from Yu Ming. Uh, if you, I can read it for you if you want. Um, I noticed that you focus on structures with certain symmetry. Can the symmetry help to facilitate your model or simulations? Since we can already get some information about physical properties from symmetric analysis. Yeah, I, I think that's also a very good question because we consider orthotropic symmetric. So maybe a, a more efficient way to train the model is just uh, fetch out a quarter of the structure and do uh, the machine learning. I think uh, that's a good uh, observation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mohammed. Uh, is there, is every microstructure generated by the decoder guaranteed to be feasible? Also, does this method provide a total speed up compared to optimizing microstructure directly, considering yeah. the training time? Yeah, uh, so I think there are two questions here. The first question is whether the decoder only generate feasible design. The answer is no, uh, it, it, can, it can generate some unfeasible design. And one more, most common phenomenon is that uh, the generated design will be blurred, which is very common for the VA model. That's why we don't use sampling. We don't directly sampling on the latent space because in that case, you will have a higher probability go into those bad regions. So what we propose in this paper is that we use the latent space as kind of control panel. We can start from someone and gradually evolve the structure so that we can uh, uh, well avoid those bad regions to generate very good uh, microstructures. And for those blur design, we just map them into zero and one design by setting some threshold. And for the second one, I think uh, you have mentioned about comparing um, the TO method directly on the microstructure and our methods. I think um, in fact, uh, in this, uh, let me show you, yeah. In this problem, we have about uh, 6.25 million elements, and we use six CPU and only take about seven hours, uh, 11 hours. So I think if we need to concurrently design the multi, uh, micro scale and multi scale, I think the uh, time needed for the conventional method will be much larger. The reason uh, we have a higher isolation because we don't need to uh, regenerate or re-optimize each unit cell. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the last one is from uh, Ole. I think it is a good idea to use network to look for a structure that achieves a given non-extreme displacement. Do you agree that solving the problem of minimizing displacement or compliance is much more difficult? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I think um, currently, um, I, I think the question is we are focusing on the prescribed distortion design, but why we don't apply it to some classical compliance methods. Uh, I, I think there are two reasons for this. The first one is that uh, we have found that the porous design is not, uh, cannot provide any extra benefits for the compliance design. 
And the second one is that we want to show um, how our uh, methods can achieve special uh, properties uh, for a very special property uh, behavior. That's why we choose this problem. And we also found that uh, it seems that do, uh, performing the optimization on prescribed distortion is a big um, difficult than the conventional uh, compliance design. Yeah, Thank if you. I add if I add to this comment, Oli, basically for traditional compliance problem, probably the traditional method will work more efficiently. So, so yeah. this kind of data driven method will, will be more powerful for the distortion uh, target kind of problem that we're showing here. And then there's some other problems that we are um, so some other applications we're also working on. A good Thank point, and that's what I thought. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you, Li Wei. I think uh, we have uh, all the speakers presented and I do see some questions from the audience. So uh, wait, why don't we, uh, we probably can open the floor for some quick discussions. Yeah, so um, thank you for everyone's participation. And uh, then our speaker also did their best job to squeeze in the information within 10 minutes. So I see some of the question already being covered by the response from the speaker. Um, but there's a couple of things emerge from the, the, uh, the question is that the first question is about this data set, right? How large it should be? Um, and uh, the second question is more about the uh, deep learning or other neural network architecture. Like as a user, how do we decide? How do we construct uh, a good architecture for that? So I'd like to just open the floor to the speaker. Anyone likes to kind of uh, uh, give, uh, give your insight based on your experience about the data set and also about architecture. Maybe Yongming, um, I see you have responded a few questions on that. Sure. Could you share your experience? Yeah. Okay, so uh, currently for the work, we have uh, published, uh, you know, the data set is around a few tens of a thousand. And uh, to be honest, it still costs a lot of uh, time. We have to we had to use uh, one or two months to get these uh, data from the numerical simulation. But this is a one-time cost, right? So once you have the once you have the data set, then you can use it very efficiently to generate uh, new structures. I think uh, there's a certain expense, a certain cost for this uh, data-driven approach. But on the other hand, people are really aware of the issue of the on the demand of the data, we have a uh, different uh, techniques to overcome this uh, issue, such as uh, transfer learning. I think uh, a few the speakers already mentioned. We also have some self-supervised uh, learning method potentially can overcome this uh, issue. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I very much agree your point that this, this is offline and online issue, right? So when we mm -hmm. compare the efficiency, we normally do not count for offline simulations. Yeah. We usually just count for online simulation data points. Any, any other speaker like to respond to this question about the data set and as well as the architecture? So Glasho, you have been talking about using both online and offline together. So when that happened, um, how do you really assess the computational efficiency? Do you also focus on just online only or you actually look at both cost? Uh, well, we, uh, what I presented uh, today was uh, fully online. Uh, that's what we call our generation one of the universal approach. However, in our uh, last generation, then uh, we are doing an uh, offline training. And uh, this uh, allow us tremendous efficiency compared uh, to the generation one, and also allow us to solve uh, a large class of problems uh, very efficiently with uh, just a small fraction of uh, the computational resources. Uh, however, this work is under development. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that's a very good point. So another question I see having coming up or implicitly is really how do we count for manufacturability, right? That's to do with the, say how different unit cell connect with each other as well as whether the inverse design is a feasible solution. Um, so Glasha, I see you want to answer this question. I, I do, I do, I do, I do. I really do. 
Uh, and uh, again, uh, this, uh, as I showed in my talk, uh, this is our state of the art, and this is a demonstration of what we did. This is the demonstration of our uh, capabilities. What happened is, my experience is the following. There are a lot of papers in the literature that are very nice. All the approaches are very nice. And uh, they even have manufacturing in the title, but they don't deliver. There is no manufacturing at the end. And our experience has been that uh, uh, we are very good, including myself, in developing very complicated things. But at the end, they may not lead to a path for manufacturing. Uh, for example, uh, in 3D, for example, you may have regions uh, with no accessibility. If you have a very complex theory that gives you extremely beautiful micro microstructures, but uh, they have uh, no accessible uh, regions, that thing does not lead uh, to a manufacturable solution. So uh, I think uh, this is an approach that, uh, especially with uh, the big data and the uh, machine learning and AI, uh, can also, there is a, a link here from uh, what we do in topology optimization to manufacturing. Uh, how, uh, because uh, for example, a naive approach, you can, even the biggest for manufacturing, the biggest supercomputer in the world may not allow us to do uh, the manufacturing, for example, the additive manufacturing using a standard STL files, for example. There is no way that that thing can be done. Uh, we need new ideas. And uh, this is something I, I think is missing in, in the literature. And uh, I think that's something that uh, should, I, I believe will be emphasized more and more as we go. Um, so we're approaching to, we're already exceeding the time here. So um, I would like to thank everyone, the speakers, the, um, the audience and the organizer for participating. And this is a relatively new topic in this field and uh, uh, we anticipate there will be a lot more publication. Actually, we find that, that when we collect all the papers, uh, there are more and more papers coming out you know, from very different source, different journals. So definitely there's strong interest in the subject. So I encourage everyone who are working in this area uh, to send the paper to WCSMO. The deadline again is February the 15th. I'm sure what there will be a session there that allow us to have more uh, continuing discussions on this subject. And with that, I, I would like to thank everyone. Sherry, uh, do you have any last comment you want to make here? Uh, just wanted to thank everyone again. Thank both the organizers, speakers, as well as the uh, participants. And uh, hope to see you again in WCSMO in about one month. Oh, sorry, in about uh, five months. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have it it's in the, I think it's early June, if I'm yes. correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your okay. successful event. Thank you for your great effort Thank you. in organizing the webinar.